show you're about to see is a profile of Lieutenant General Lewis Burl Puller. Chesty, as the general is known among his fellow Marines, is one of the most inspirational examples of American heroism, a man who displayed the Marine Corps' values of honor, courage, and commitment. American history has been blessed with a, a multitude of heroes. In every era, at every critical moment, brave men and women have stepped up and met the challenges of their time. Perhaps this is because, as Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, heroism feels, and it never reasons, and that's why it's always right. Certainly, Chesty Puller never hesitated in battle. He never st stopped to consider his own well-being above that of his comrades and country. As a soldier, Chesty fought bravely in three wars, risking his life and limb time and time again to protect the lives of his comrades. As an officer, he led by example, upholding the highest traditions of service. He was a uniquely American hero, a descendant of Revolutionary War patriot Patrick Henry, who observed that battle was not to the strong alone, but to the vigilant, the active, and the brave. Vigilant, active, brave, Chesty was all of those, an inspiration to all who follow in his footsteps. He was a Marine with the face of a bulldog and the heart of a warrior. A man of stunning ferocity and surprising tenderness, whose love for his country and for his men inspired remarkable feats of valor. Leading troops across two continents in three wars, he blazed a bright trail across the 20th century, earning more medals than any other Marine in history. Even in a service that prides itself on making exceptional bravery routine, his record of courage was extraordinary. His epic career so defined what a Marine should be that decades after his death, men who never met or served with him come together on the anniversary of his death to remember his life and rededicate their own. He was Chesty Puller, the Marine's Marine. It's a fitting place to begin a warrior's tale. Virginia, birthplace of the nation, birthplace of heroes, of George Washington, of Thomas Jefferson. Since the days before the Republic, Virginia has sired men who have shaped our visions of freedom and bravery. Here, in the cradle of patriotism, Lewis Burwell Puller was born in June of 1898 in the village of West Point. Lewis Puller grew up on tales of courage in the name of freedom and also of heroism in the name of a lost cause. For Virginia was home to the capital of a second nation, the Confederate States of America. Grandsons of a Confederate cavalryman who fought with Jeb Stuart and died at Kelly's Ford, Lewis and his brother Sam were raised on the war stories of Civil War veterans. He told more stories about ancestors. We all knew about John William Puller who died at Kelly's Ford. He was very proud of this grandfather. Lewis learned early that men died in battle. He also learned that war offered a rare glory to men brave enough to embrace its dangerous beauty. Some warriors lived and triumphed, and from boyhood, he wanted to be one of them. Perhaps the tales told by the old men around him sparked his search for written accounts of the martial life. While still a boy, Lewis tackled Caesar's Gallic War in Latin. His impatience to know the story soon drove him to a translation but his lifelong passion for military history was fully forged. Lewis's capacity for leadership and responsibility was tested early. His father died young, leaving him at age 10 the man of the family. Without hesitation or complaint, he shouldered the responsibilities of provider, earning money for the family any way he could. Later in his career, he said the lessons of his boyhood, hunting, stalking, making each shot count, taught him more about the art of war than any formal training he ever received. At the age of 19, Lewis Puller entered BMI and began his own military career, stepping into the footsteps of generations of heroes whose stories were as familiar to him as his own name. Puller's own generation of BMI cadets set high standards of glory. 
Just ahead of him were two boys who grew into military leaders of towering stature. George S. Patton and George C. Marshall, the only career military officer to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. When America entered World War I, the nation was so ill-prepared that rifles were commandeered from BMI and other military schools for use in combat. Lewis uh, Puller uh, went to the authorities at BMI with the very reasonable and logical uh, uh, thought that, well, if they need rifles, they're going to need people to shoot them, and I want to be there for that job. He had been at VMI only a year, too young to get an Army commission. He knew the Marines would take him immediately. So on 27 June 1918, the day after his 20th birthday, Lewis Puller enlisted in the Marine Corps and headed for boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina. From his first days at Paris Island, Puller stood out among the new recruits as a natural soldier. One drill instructor said of Puller, I bet that guy even sleeps at attention. But he recognized the young man's gift for leadership and gave him a platoon to train in squad movements. Lewis had his men in shape in a week. He was, in the words of his first sergeant, a perfect drill instructor. No one was surprised when Puller was among the 5% of his class chosen for training as a drill instructor. Puller trained hard for combat in France, hoping to join the Marines fighting in Chateau Thierry. He almost made it. His battalion was packing for transit to France when Armistice Day canceled their orders. Despite all his best efforts, Lewis Puller's first war had ended before he could get to the front. Fresh out of officer's training, Puller saw his military career ending before it could begin. Peacetime had created a sudden surplus of soldiers. Just two weeks after gaining his longed-for second lieutenant's bars, Lewis found himself back on the street with hundreds of other newly minted officers. But Lewis Puller knew he was born to be a military man. He would serve his apprenticeship in the craft of war. The only question was where. With no Kaiser to fight, the Marines looked closer to home for the next front. They found it in the unsteady regimes of Central America and the Caribbean, small countries torn by civil wars and old-fashioned banditry. The Marines served as America's colonial troops, fighting guerrillas, keeping order, and propping up tottering regimes, a kind of U.S. Foreign Legion in Latin America. Because United Fruit, a powerful U.S. import corporation, was practically running many of these small agricultural nations, the conflicts there were dubbed the Banana Wars. In July 1950, the Haitian government had collapsed during a bloody revolt in which two presidents were assassinated within 36 hours. The Marines sent in to protect American and European embassies soon became partners in an unusual joint military venture. Haiti abolished its army and set up the Gendarmerie de Haiti, a constabulary of Haitian enlisted men commanded by American officers. The war in Haiti was already five years old when Chesty Puller embraced it as his personal training exercise. On the advice of a superior officer, he signed up to serve in the Haitian constabulary. For the young warrior eager to earn his stripes, the Banana Wars were a godsend. He offered Puller on-the-job training in more than 40 battles against the Cacos, fierce tribesmen who knew their native wilderness the way he knew the backwoods of Virginia. In the sweat-drenched, mosquito-infested tropics, Lewis Puller learned the rudiments of guerrilla warfare and the importance of leading from the thick of battle. Puller's willingness to risk his own life with the troops he commanded quickly became the stuff of legend. While still in his 20s, Lewis Puller found himself becoming larger than life. Soon, he was known throughout the Marine Corps as Chesty. One look at Puller, and you know where the name Chesty came from. He had a barrel chest. It was very obvious. He had very long legs and a very short upper body, but his chest stuck out like a barrel. And uh, so somebody started calling him Chesty. And uh, I guess it just stuck. In Haiti, he was decorated for the first time, awarded the Medaille Militaire for what the citation described as valor in action, with fine disregard for his own life. 
Puller's service in Haiti earned him second lieutenant's rank in the U.S. Marines. Returning to Portsmouth in 1924, he displayed his new bars to a corporal on sentry duty and growled, well, I've got them now. All I need is a war. For several years, Chesty bounced from one U.S. base to another, impatient for action, knowing his career was at a standstill. His dreams of military glory seemed hopelessly out of reach. Then in the spring of 1926, on a short leave at home in Virginia, the young warrior suddenly learned that there might be more to life than combat. At a dance in a neighboring town, Lieutenant Puller was introduced to Virginia Evans. I think my father really loved my mother from the very first time he met her. After only three tongue-tied dances, he blurted out a proposal of marriage, which she laughingly rejected. Well, mother wasn't ready to get married to anybody. I mean, you could have been Prince Charming. It wouldn't have made any difference. Virginia didn't know it then, but Chesty Puller would not take no for an answer. He wouldn't see her again for nearly 11 years, but the letters, the flowers, and the proposals would never stop. Then in 1928, the Banana Wars beckoned again. Puller was sent to Nicaragua, where Marines led a native army, the Guardia Nacional, similar to the force he'd commanded in Haiti. Nicaragua's guerrillas were a much more formidable force than the one Chesty had faced in Haiti. Chesty had few reliable intelligence sources. The guerrillas were fast, stealthy, and brave. Often, the only way to find the enemy was to let them ambush his patrols, then shoot it out with the ambushers. So that's what Chesty Puller did. When he went into combat, he had the self-confidence that knowledge brings to be able to get out in front and to lead his men. And his men knew that he knew what he was doing. Over a seven month period in 1930, Puller led five successive engagements against superior forces, routing the enemy every time. His headlong bravery earned him a Navy Cross. The decoration cited Puller's intelligent and forceful leadership without thought of his own personal safety. Nicaraguan newspapers dubbed him El Tigre. In late September of 1932, he plunged into the jungle at the head of a company of 40 Guardia Nacional, 100 dense jungle miles from any possible support. Fuller's small band of 40 was ambushed by more than 150 guerrillas armed with machine guns. As Chesty's citation for his second Navy Cross would describe it, Lieutenant Puller, with great courage, coolness, and display of military judgment, so directed the fire and movement of his men, that the enemy were driven first from the high ground, and finally were scattered in confusion. The boy who had come south to learn warfare had proved himself a commander of indomitable courage. For the trooper, the nearest person he deals with as an officer is a second lieutenant. And in effect, Chesty had the job of a second lieutenant when he was down in Nicaragua and Haiti. He understood this dealing with the fighting men, and he spoke the fighting man's lingo. With no more wars to fight close to home, Chesty Puller found himself on his way to China. The Marines had begun their long China duty in 1900 as part of an international force sent in to protect foreigners during the Boxer Rebellion. As the 30s wore on and the threat of war grew, in a curious legacy of the earlier conflict, both the U.S. and Japan maintained troops in Peking and Shanghai. Puller's first assignment in China was command of the Horse Marines, an elite unit which formed part of the Peking Embassy Guard. Then, in service on the USS Augusta, flagship of the Asiatic Fleet, he crisscrossed Asia for two years. And from every exotic port, his letters found their way back to Virginia. There seemed to be a split at the very center of Lewis Puller. The heartsick lover vied with the dedicated professional military man. In public, Puller declared that the Marine Corps should be a monastic order, that it shouldn't permit marriage at all. Married men make poor soldiers, he reportedly said. If the government wanted you to have a wife, they'd have issued you one. In private, continued to pursue Virginia, albeit from afar. 
Every time he came back to the United States, he'd come to see her. And finally, she said yes. And on 13 November 1937, he married his cherished Virginia at a church near their childhood homes. He'd finally won the woman of his dreams. But war clouds were gathering as Puller returned to China with his bride. Now a major, he was assigned to the 4th Marine Regiment, guarding the international zone in a tense Shanghai, which already was partially occupied by the Japanese. It seems fitting that Chesty Puller should have been the first American to draw a weapon on the Japanese army, and that it should happen long before there was any declaration of war between the two nations. By international agreement, the international zone was off limits to Japanese troops, but one night, in violation of that agreement, about 80 Japanese soldiers marched in and rounded up some 200 Chinese to take away as prisoners. Puller, at the head of only 22 Marines, confronted the much larger Japanese force. While his men aimed two machine guns at the trespassers, Puller pointed his 45 at the Japanese commander and offered him and his troops five minutes of safe passage. Though the Japanese officer spoke no English, he understood Chesty perfectly. He released the prisoners and withdrew his troops. Chesty and Virginia's first child, Virginia McCandlish Puller, Virginia Mac, was born in Shanghai in May 1940. But as tensions rose in the Pacific, the proud father was increasingly anxious about the safety of his family. When mother and I left China, father said it was the happiest day of his life when he saw his wife and daughter on a ship that pulled out of Shanghai. He missed them cruelly. And in this, and the many other separations to come, he would write Virginia daily. How I would love to have you and Virginia Mackey with me, but China is no place for an American woman now. Sooner or later, we will be involved with the Axis powers. I thank God every day for your being safely home. In less than a year, he would follow them back to the States. For a brief, happy time, the longing was over. But their reunion must have been bittersweet. But the drums of war were beating unmistakably now. It was only a question of where and when the trumpets would call him to fight. Back in the States, where his letters had said he longed to be, Lewis Puller took command of the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. His charge, to prepare them for the war everyone knew was coming, the war he'd waited for all his life. Chesty and Virginia were in Saluda at his mother-in-law's home on the day the waiting ended. Stunned moments after the news of Pearl Harbor broke, his first thought was for the men left behind. Why don't they say something about the Marines in China, he growled. Overnight, it seemed, the country caught up with Chesty Puller. Japan's treachery galvanized the nation for war. The country just seemed to come together everywhere you went. It was just a good old USA, good old USA, we'll fight him, we'll fight him. The veteran of Haiti and Nicaragua knew only too well what that fight would require. As one of the only men in his unit who had seen actual combat, Chesty was determined to teach his recruits all he knew, to make marksmen of every one of them, to get them ready for war. The Japanese had followed their attack on Pearl Harbor with a stunning sweep across the Pacific. In quick succession, they seized the Philippines, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaya, and the Dutch East Indies. A growing web of air bases in the captured territories threatened to extend Japan's reach all the way to New Guinea and Australia. It was time for the Allies to strike back. Military planners singled out a Japanese-held island in the Solomons for the first U.S. offensive of the war. Its name was Guadalcanal. Chesty Puller's Marines were given the job of wresting it away from battle-hardened defenders. Major Lewis Puller was finally going to war for his country. But even with the sound of the drums loud in his ears, he never forgot Virginia. A letter written shortly before the battle began reveals a side of Lewis Puller few of his Marines would ever see. Life is so short, and when I was a child, I thought it would last forever and ever. My love for you will, Virginia, 
even into the next life and then on. The hardest thing that I've ever done is to tell you goodbye. The long and bloody campaign on Guadalcanal began on 7 August 1942, eight months to the day after Pearl Harbor. The amphibious landing surprised the Japanese. By the time they finally realized the island had been invaded, 24 hours had passed and more than 11,000 Marines had landed. When we landed on the island, the Japanese had the upper hand as far as, uh, not in numbers, but in control of the, uh, the, the surrounding waters. Right at the front of the action, leading the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, was the legendary Chesty Puller. He fought like a man with no fear, always on the front line beside his men. And he expected his officers to do the same. Father told me once, if you did your duty, you didn't have to worry about being scared. The struggle for Henderson Airfield on Guadalcanal was an epic battle, with advantage shifting back and forth over weeks of fighting. Control of the airfield was essential to both American and Japanese battle plans. In late October, Puller's battalion was charged with holding the airfield against a major Japanese assault. It was the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines were attacked. This was Chesty Puller's uh, battalion. Chesty's lines were spread out just like all the other lines were spread out. We just didn't have enough men. Covering an area that should have been defended by twice as many men, Puller's Marines killed more than 1,400 Japanese during one endless rain night. For his tireless devotion to duty and cool judgment under fire, while holding the line against a Japanese force superior in numbers, Puller won his third Navy Cross. Puller was up in the front lines, essentially here with us, and whenever actions we had, we turned around and looked, and there was Puller. But Guadalcanal was not yet secured. Less than two weeks later, Puller was up at the point as usual when a Japanese shell exploded in front of him, knocking him down and peppering him with shrapnel. As he struggled to his feet, a sniper shot him twice in the arm. Chester remained in command for more than 24 hours, awaiting his relief and refusing to be carried to safer ground. Even after he reached a field hospital, he insisted doctors leave one piece of shrapnel in his leg because an operation to remove it would require his evacuation from Guadalcanal. Eight days after he was carried in on a stretcher, he limped back out to battle. The fight for Guadalcanal showed military leaders on both sides the terrible cost the Pacific War would demand. In February 1943, the Japanese finally evacuated the island, leaving behind more than 25,000 dead. The victory cost the Marines 1,100 men killed and more than twice that number. While his division regrouped in Australia, Chesty was sent back to the States. His orders? Go to Army training camps and tell Green troops what you've learned. Tell the Army and Marine brass what went wrong and what went right in the Pacific. He did his duty so well that General George C. Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, commended him, saying, undoubtedly, you've saved the lives of a good many soldiers. The stateside tour meant welcome days with Virginia, but soon, just he was headed back to war. Invasion. Cape Gloucester on the island of New Britain. Early morning. On 26 December 1943, the 1st Marine Division once again stormed ashore against a determined enemy. This time at Cape Gloucester near New Guinea. Commanding the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, Puller led an advance against an airfield Days later, he took charge of another battalion after its officers were wounded. Under constant enemy fire and torrential rains, Puller's Marines slogged through dense jungles in a three-week campaign against entrenched Japanese forces. Like a man incapable of fear, Chesty moved from company to company in the front lines along a fire-swept ridge. This was adrenaline, opportunity, liquor, whatever. I mean, this. He really, really liked being a troop leader. His forceful leadership and gallant spirit earned him a fourth Navy Cross. No other Marine had ever been so honored. 
Chesty Puller's next target was Peleliu, an island about halfway between New Guinea and the Philippines. Invasion planners for General Douglas MacArthur's return to the Philippines believed control of Peleliu was necessary to protect the general's flank. The island was surrounded by coral reefs and mangrove swamps, but its dominant feature was a long, steep ridge honeycombed with caves that offered natural pillboxes for the Japanese defenders. Puller's Marines had the invasion's toughest assignment, take that ridge. The assault began on 15 September 1944. From the moment they headed ashore, everything that could go wrong did. Contrary to the estimates of U.S. invasion planners, Peleliu was heavily fortified. Heavy fire raked the landing craft, killing hundreds before they could even reach the beach. Every tree on that place had been stripped. There was nothing but a great chalky coral wasteland. Temperature 120. You must understand that Peleliu had been fortified for many, many years. Dug in, concreted, reinforced, underground railroads, everything. The Marines were on top of the ground and the Japanese were under the ground, and that made tough fighting. Barely two weeks into the battle, half of Puller's regiment was gone. His pleas for more men were answered with grim truth. There were no more reinforcements to send. As the battle raged on, a young lieutenant was sent to find Puller. Everyone he asked pointed him forward toward the fighting. So I kept going and going, and pretty soon I was crawling because it was bullets and machine guns, and, uh, and he's up there, and this is Puller. Puller perfectly. The man was up there, not running the thing, but up there where he could maneuver and where he could bring in the artillery and where he could support the troops. Beautiful, beautiful. In nine days of continuous fighting, Chesty's troops killed nearly 4,000 Japanese soldiers, but at a terrible cost. More than half his first Marines were dead or wounded. No regiment in Marine history had ever lost so many in a single battle. A standing order from the commanding general was to uh, move, maintain the momentum at all costs. That was the order. And that's what Paul did. I did see him, when, uh, and he told me about Peleliu. He seemed to be distraught. He knew that so many of his men had died and I think it dwelled on his mind so much. The public Chesty Puller always said men who died in battle were simply doing their duty. Privately, he grieved the loss of every fallen Marine. Among them his own brother, fighting with the 4th Marines on Guam. Colonel Puller expected to seek his vengeance in the invasion of mainland Japan. Plans called for virtually every man in the Marine Corps to take part in the invasion, Operation expected to be far larger than the D-Day landings at Normandy. Chesty was ordered back to the United States to train Marines for this final terrible battle of the war. Once again, Chesty Puller was preparing to follow the guns into battle. But, once again, a world war ended with Chesty Puller waiting at home. In the rubble of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, many saw the end of Chesty Puller's style of warfare. Science had harnessed the power of the sun. Lesser weapons and the armies that wielded them might be obsolete. But Chesty Puller wasn't ready for the junk heap. After spending more than half his life as a Marine, he was legendary throughout the Corps for his physical and mental courage and for his fierce devotion to the fighting man on the line. But even a legend couldn't fight Washington's new approach to warfare. At the end of the hot war, all branches of the military were dwindling. At that time, the government was uh, toying with the idea of reducing the Marine Corps size. There was a comment made by uh, President Truman that the Marine Corps was nothing but a glorified police force. This upset uh, the Marine Corps greatly. The Corps dodged extinction, but the cuts were savage, leaving Colonel Puller little room to rise higher. The great warrior of the Pacific was put out to pasture to command the Marine barracks at Pearl Harbor. It was a dead-end assignment whose only consolation was a grand house for Virginia and the kids. Then 
on 25 June 1950, North Korean troops stormed across the 38th parallel into South Korea. American leaders suspected Stalin and Mao were behind the offensive and rushed to enlist UN support for a quick counterattack. The armed invasion of the Republic of Korea continues. I am proud to report that the United States is prepared to furnish assistance to the Republic of Korea. He immediately telephoned the commandant of the Marine Corps and wanted to have his old regiment back. He was given command of the 1st Marine Regiment, the same regiment he had led at Cape Gloucester and Peleliu. But this was the same regiment in name only. He had primarily reserve components and skeleton units um, that had to be refilled with reserves, uh, such as myself, um, and, and units that had never worked together before. Many men who had served under Chesty during World War II pleaded for a chance to fight beside him again. They would follow him to Hill. And I, I think I would follow him because he was first string. In 10 days, with men like these beside him, Poor molded a new regiment, a fighting force good enough to be called the 1st Marines. Most uh, enlisted men like myself, we were lucky to know our lieutenant's name, maybe the battalion commander, but never would we know who the division commander was or who, but we all know who Chester Fuller was. <laughs> By August 1950, the first troops sent to the aid of South Korea had fought to a stalemate on a small toehold of land at the southern tip of the country. To break the deadlock, General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the UN forces, conceived a bold plan. He would open an entirely new front in the war with a landing at Incheon, a harbor city just south of Seoul. From there, UN troops would retake the South Korean capital and cut North Korea's communications with its troops in the field. It was a difficult, high-stakes gamble. It was exactly where Chesty Puller wanted to be. Puller went before the men and said, we are the most fortunate of men. We are going to have the opportunity to use the tools of our trade. He could inspire men to courage, to do their best, to do far beyond what they thought they could do initially. On 15 September, after just three months of training, Puller led his men ashore at Incheon. The city was a formidable target. Tides varied as much as 35 feet, flooding and ebbing over 6,000 yards of mud flats. Landing craft would have to navigate a narrow channel accessible only on a high flooding tide. And we floated back and forth while the Navy shelled the, uh, the beaches at Incheon. There was a great huge wall there that had to be uh, uh, knocked out, if you will, drive holes to it so we'd get over it easier. As always, Chesty led from the point, walking beside the lead tank as his men fought their way into the heart of Seoul. His objective was the high ground southeast of the city. To get there, he and his Marines had to climb hills and push forward in heavy fighting over rough terrain. United Nations forces drive ahead toward the Manchurian border and the power dams of northern Korea, which the communists have been fighting desperately to defend. As UN troops capture town after town, the fleeing Reds set fire to the buildings as they abandon their former strongholds. The Marines were now in position for what MacArthur hoped would be the final offensive of the war, to drive the North Korean army north across the Yalu River and into Manchuria. But the face of the enemy had changed. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese communist troops now joined the fight. They came in human waves, encircling the UN forces at the Chosin Reservoir. Well, the way Mother described it to us was that Father was in a trap. I'm not sure my mother understood much more than we did. The estimate was that we were going against about 10 Chinese divisions. That's roughly 200,000 people, and we had a force of maybe 16,000 people. As the odds against them mounted, Jesse Puller demanded even more of himself and the men under his command. So he calls up and says, what's the situation down there, old man? He said, well, the enemy's got me cut off in the rear now, and of course they're between me and you, and they're on the right and on the left. And there was this moment of silence. That's a radio telephone. He said, so what are you going to do? And here's the difference between surviving under polar and not surviving under polar. I said, attack. 
Good boy, hung up. In the fight of his life, Chesty still found the time to write Virginia at least once a day. Darling, I understand that the news back home is to the effect that the 1st Marine Division is cut off, surrounded by the Chinese, etc., etc. God is helping us. So do not worry, Virginia. He wrote Mother, and we read the letters, and he always started out, I'm fine. So he never let us know how much danger he was in. In a feat of such magnitude that it stood out even against his own legend, Chesty Pullard led his Marines in an impossible fighting withdrawal. And we were told that it was 40 below, and we had snow above our knees. You know, it was pretty, it was pretty, pretty wintry. Uh, trucks had to keep their engines running, tanks had to keep their engines running. Uh, there had to be warming tents for people to, to uh, go back and forth into, because the weather was dreadful. I started out World War II in the Solomon Islands, and I ended it in Okinawa, and uh, four years later. And I've seen hardship. But North Korea was the limit. As Puller led his men south toward the sea in safety, they all but wiped out seven Chinese divisions. I thought I was a rear guard until all of a sudden, here came this lone jeep down the road. Guess who it was? Chesty Poor. He was the last man out of the reservoir, not the tank platoon. He evacuated his wounded along with every truck and cannon that could move including equipment that had been abandoned by retreating army units. And he insisted on carrying with him every man who fell in the fight. One Marine historian called the Chosin Reservoir withdrawal one of those military masterpieces that occur when skill and bravery fuse to defy rational explanation. Chesty himself put it differently in a letter written to Virginia and his three children shortly after his troops safely reached the sea at Hung Nam. With the help of the Almighty, and no other unit or person. My regiment is on the beach at Hong Nam and will be aboard ship before the day is over. I'm thankful to the good God for all his blessings. Chesty Puller's extraordinary heroism at Cho Sin earned him an unprecedented fifth Navy Cross. And for his heroism in rescuing trapped army units in the fighting retreat, the Army awarded him its Distinguished Service Cross. Two congressmen later introduced bills aimed at awarding him the Medal of Honor, the highest the nation can bestow. But the medal never came. Not that Chesty cared very much. His medals, I don't think, meant anything. I had them in my bureau drawer till I was in college, wrapped up in Kleenex. In January 1951, Chesty Puller was promoted to Brigadier General and named Assistant Commander of the 1st Marine Division. He received his last promotion, the three stars of a lieutenant general at his retirement on 31 October, 1955. He had served in the Marine Corps for 37 years, 27 of them overseas. The lone virtue Chesty Puller found in retirement was the chance to spend more time with Virginia and the family that had always been his anchor. They were the most, I think, um, sought after couple in Virginia because mother was so feminine and father was so masculine that they complimented one another. They were really, really, really in love. I mean, it was amazing. The romance lasted between two totally dissimilar people. It was in a war he never fought that Chesty Puller took his most grievous injury. Vietnam was a new kind of war, a war for a new age. Despite Chesty's reservations about this new jungle war, if Marines were going to Vietnam, he didn't want to be left behind. At the age of 68, Chesty Puller requested a return to active duty. So every week, he sent the Commandant of the Marine Corps a wire from Saluda requesting active duty. And his basic pitch was that if you won't will be an act of duty. Let me at least tell you how I think we ought to run this war. This time, the Marines said no. Chesty would have to sit this one out. But though the old jungle fighter stayed home as more and more of his beloved Marines shipped out, his heart went with each of them, and especially with his only son. Second Lieutenant Lewis Puller Jr. was leading his men from the front in true Puller style when he tripped a mine. He lost both legs and parts of both hands. No 
one doubted Chesty would have given his soul to take his son's place. As casualties mounted, Chesty spoke out against the war. The more his one-time superiors chafed at his criticism, the more the enlisted men loved him. They came to Saluda in a never-ending stream. Marines who had served under him and others who wished they had, all making a pilgrimage to a legend. Puller had an incredible ability to bring out the best in people, people from all walks of life, to inspire them, to make them able to do more than they thought they could ever do, to give them self-confidence, to give them courage. Mother knew that father, I think, needed that momentum of the Marines, um, and so she'd always put a place at the table. He got his hat and walked out with us uh, down the walkway and across the street, turned to us and said, made us both promise that we would come back to see him. And we promised him we would. And when I looked at him and shook his hand, I noticed this tear coming down his face. I'll never forget it. It was a very emotional moment. And I'll always remember that was the last time I saw him alive. On 11 October 1971, Lewis Burwell Chesty Puller died at the age of 73. At his request, he was buried in Saluda, Virginia, near his family, rather than in Arlington National Cemetery. 1,500 active duty and retired Marines, including 24 generals, attended his funeral. The Commandant of the Marine Corps eulogized his friend. Chesty Puller showed his toughness in everything, from engaging an enemy to taking care of his Marines. And in both, he always won because he always gave the very best of himself. The example and legend of Chesty Puller is part of our Corps forever. People like General Puller are our touchstone, touchstone to the past, to the valor, to the dedication serves as a, an example for our young Marines. Choosing to be a warrior as your profession, to live in the open, to sit in foxholes half filled with water, uh, to be in combat, uh, you just need something a little bit bigger than yourself and your religion and your country. There always has to be a hero. And he was, he was a hero. And he's the only hero, the best hero. He's just a superb human being. To this day, the pilgrimages to Saluda continue. Each year, a memorial service is held at Chesty's grave on 10 November, the Marine Corps birthday. In that service, and in other ceremonies around the world, Marines honor the fighting spirit that was Chesty Paul. He is still part of the Corps. He is still the example of leadership that is held out to young men and women 